There was five of us who had a terrible feeling that we were going to be killed the next day. It just overwhelmed us. We said goodbye to everybody in the company. And two of us were killed, three of us were wounded. Those five who got that premonition it was amazing. Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. I was assigned to an infantry company, and uh, I was assigned uh, to the second platoon, second squad. Now that brings out a whole story, because when I went into basic training, I was in the second squad, second platoon. When I went to advanced, even in the ASTP, I was in the second squad, second platoon. I went to uh, advanced infantry training. I ended up in the second squad, second platoon. I began to think about this. And when I ended up in the second squad, second platoon in the 30th division, I says, something's <laughs> going on here. And I became very superstitious that um, when I was wounded, um, they sent me to Le a hospital in Liege, Belgium. But when we got to the first hospital, they waved us off and said, we were full, Take, and they took us to another hospital. That night, that hospital I was originally supposed to go into was hit by a buzz bomb or a V-1 rocket. You know, the Germans were developing these rockets, and not only had they given uh, Britain a uh, beating with that, but uh, they were using it on the towns in Belgium and Holland. So... Uh, I then decided, I said, if I get out of this hospital, I don't want to go through the replacement depot system because there's no guarantee I'll get back to my outfit. If I, get, if I can get out of here, I will go back to my second squad, second platoon, because I felt fate had made it that way for me. So I went to the head of the hospital. I had been there three weeks, and I said, uh, I'm better now. I'd like to go back to my outfit. He says, well... Your whole group that came in that day are going back to Paris for a, a little rest. You've earned it. I says, no, I don't want to go back to Paris. He says, well, you have to go back to Paris. So I went back to the uh, room, and an orderly had all who had overheard my conversation. He says, you know, see the, over there, those ambulances? Well, that third ambulance is going back to the front lines. I says, thank you. And he told me when. I was there, and I left with that ambulance, headed for the front lines. I rejoined them. Wasn't a very good time to rejoin them, because that afternoon, we get an alarm, where the alarm goes around, everybody pack up, and they put us on trucks, and we're headed south. Nobody knows why or where. And that night, there were planes buzzing us, and uh, there were German planes. And we just couldn't understand what all this action was about. And finally, they got us down to Malmende in Belgium. And we got off the trucks. And there is cooks, bakers, engineers. They're all dug in on this railroad track. 
and they're being attacked by uh, the Germans, uh, by Piper, who was a man who had plenty of experience on the Russian front, front and he was trying to get through to uh, um, the gas uh, depots just above us. Stan, before you go on, you mentioned that you were wounded. Under what circumstances were you wounded? Uh, we had um, closed the gap at around Aachen, Germany. This was before the bulge. And um, we were riding tanks to take this town. Now, I, don't, I can't remember whether we were coming out of Warden, Germany, or going into Warden, Germany. You know, the, the towns uh, get a little mixed. Uh, but we were riding these tanks, and the artillery was coming in ferociously. And uh, the tanks stopped and said they wouldn't go on until we took the town because the, it was just too much artillery. So we started going and firing from the hips, marching into town, and in front of me was a tree. Do I go to the left or do I go to the right? Something pushed me to the right. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you what I found out what it was later on. The shell came in, fell to the left of the tree. The tree took most of the shrapnel. I only got the head, the arm, and the leg in a couple of places. And uh, I then went to that hospital in Liège. Now, there was, but the night before, there was five of us who had a terrible feeling that we were going to be killed the next day. It just overwhelmed us. We said goodbye to everybody in the company. And two of us were killed, three of us were wounded, those five who got that premonition. It was amazing. Let me tell you, every time I went into battle, I was scared because everybody thought this was the last time you had a chance to, to breathe the fresh air. So I said a prayer and I asked for help. Something pushed me where I was laying to another spot. And lo and behold, where I was laying, a shell fell in. And then we went on to attack the airport and we took the airport. Uh, there were many instances where I, I escaped, and I don't know how or what, but something was always there to push me out of danger. Later on, I wanted to know why, and I felt very guilty. Why did I live and all these guys got killed? So I began the study of yoga, and I did a lot of meditation. And my answer I got back is, you were kept alive to help others. And I made it my life's business to get involved with other people and to do things that uh, will help. But uh, I find not only uh, am I helping other people, but I help myself. And uh, I've gotten rid of that guilt that I carried around me for many years. Uh, why did I come out of the war and others didn't? Uh, and I, th I sometimes I think about these guys that we killed. They never knew that we won the war. Here they fought and fought, got killed, and they never knew that we were the winners. Stan, will you take us back to the days of the Battle of the Bulge? Oh. Take us to the town of Malmody and let us know what you experienced during that dark December of 44. It was cold. It was wet. It was miserable. And uh, I don't think I've ever, I've, I'm still always cold. It was so bad that I, if we took off a coat from the body heat and the humidity from the body, it would freeze. And we used those to cover our foxholes to help us from the uh, barrages. You know, we were dug in, in forests, and uh, when the shells came in and they hid in the tree, boy, they spread all over and came down with a force. So uh, that's, uh, we used them as foxhole covers. But when we got to Malmody, uh, it was, it was quite a battle. First of all, we were against a panzer division, SS panzer division. And um, we've, most of the time, the 30th division was called Roosevelt's SS division because we were always fighting an SS outfit. And there were some very unfortunate things that happened between uh, the outfits, which we don't talk about rather not talk about. 
But Stan, why? Because I didn't believe, you know, man's inhumanity to man is really something to behold. And it still goes on, unfortunately. And I just hope and pray someday that uh, man will learn to live with each other. It, it, it's it's mind-boggling the things I saw. Uh, our troops, their troops, you can't blame them, you can't blame us, but some of the atrocities uh, are beyond uh, comprehension and beyond any human element. Stan, did the Malmody massacre have anything to do to, oh. to perpetuate those atrocities during this period of time? We, when we first got to um, uh, Malmody and even in Belgium, most of the units that uh, were sent in to stop the Germans, we didn't know where the front lines were. And so we were sent out on patrols. Now, uh, we had sent out small patrols for two days. On the third day, we were to send out a patrol of 70. If we didn't capture uh, prisoners by morning, we were to attack a town and bring back prisoners. That's how bad intelligence wanted to have prisoners so they can interrogate. Well, on the way, we going through this area and uh, snow covered, and we see like, looks like stacks of wood. And uh, so our uh, uh, captain sent four of us over to uh, investigate. And sure, we, we found there were bodies, we turned them over and we saw there were Americans. But we had an objective and we couldn't spend any time there. So what we did, we took helmets back with us. In your helmet on the liner um, was the uh, first initial of your last name and the four last numbers of your serial number. So we brought back four of them and uh, we went on, uh, captured, attacked the town, captured two prisoners and brought them back to be interrogated and we turned in the helmets. We found out that this was what was called the Mound of the Massacre, which was done by uh, Piper's men, and later he stood trial for these uh, massacres. We were sent on a patrol to make contact with the first uh, uh, division. Now, we're going through the woods and we come to the cemetery, and all of a sudden we hear noise, and we start going up to this, and behind the big tomb, there we met some of the 1st Division, and we had, knew we had joined forces, and we knew they were, you know, on one side of us. And uh, then we had to start pushing the Germans back. So we had to attack a few towns, and we had a tough time in some of them. Uh, took and a lot you of said casualty. you had to attack a town. Yes. What type of experience was that? It was not a lot of fun because it, we, uh, the town that, w the one I'm thinking of, uh, was the, at the, it's either the fifth or the eighth parachute uh, group of uh, Germans who had captured this town, had been pushed out, recaptured it, and it was our job to take it again. Well, we attacked the town, and we only were able in one day to take a quarter of the town. They were fighting from house to house. And in the meantime, at night, we had to go down the hill and bring up ammunition and food. And while we were bringing this ammunition and food up, they th threw in sh artillery shells at us. But these were phosphorus. And when it landed on you, it started burning your, well, we had jackets then. We didn't wear overcoats at that time. But we had a sweater and, heavy, and a heavy jacket. And it started burning through it. Now, the jacket was only, you know, a little below the waist. And if it hit your uniform below, you got burns. And some of the guys got terrible burns. I only got a few on my jacket. But in order to get out of the way, I. I dropped the uh, box that I was carrying of uh, food, and I happened to roll down part of it and hit a tree. So I wasn't feeling too well for the next day. 
when it was, we had to take the rest of the town. But as bad as I felt, <laughs> it was the one day when I got a Silver Star uh, for action. Stan, would you describe that? Well, we, we started from the first quarter of the town, and as we started to advance crossing a big open field, the hill that was on our right was supposed to have been taken by another outfit, and it wasn't. And they had perfect view of us. So they were firing at us from the other hill, and we hit the ground. And I said to them, hey, we're going to get killed out here because a couple of guys I heard screaming for the medic. They were hit. I says, let's go and let's get out of here. And I stood up, and I, made, I had everybody uh, follow me. And then we get to this other end of town, and there's a big house with a lot of Germans in it. And they have perfect vision at it, and they're firing at us. So I went to the captain. I says, get me a uh, bazooka man. And this bazooka man and I went through the sniper. There were a lot of snipers up at the top of the building. And we got to a position, and I'm wiring up the bazooka so he could fire it. And the sh uh, bullet comes right through the bazooka and hits him in the chin and his teeth. So I couldn't, it was worthless, the bazooka then. So I then went back through uh, uh, sniper fire to the captain. I says, get me a tank, we'll blow him out of there. And he got me an anti-tank, and I directed them. There's a phone on the back of the tank. They were buttoned up, and I directed them toward the house. And uh, as they were trying to escape, I was directing their fire on them as they were escaping. And it resulted in the capture of 58 uh, soldiers in that house. So for that, they made me a sergeant and gave me a Silver Star. <laughs> Stan, I think it's very, very important for our audience to understand that the Silver Star is the third highest award given to anyone that served in combat for performing valorous actions. Congratulations. What was your most memorable moment? Uh, one of the terrible moments was when our own planes bombed us in Malmedy for three days in a row, killing hundred, hundreds of civilians and hundreds of our soldiers. And as much as we told them, we're in town. For some reason, they thought it was in the German hands. And we put out our panels, which signifies to the Air Corps where our lines are and where we are. But somehow they didn't see him or they didn't pay attention to him. And we took it for three days. That was uh, really awful. That was the worst moment. Oh, Again, was there, uh, was well, there, there were a lot of worst moments when we found moment? the bodies and we realized what had happened at the massacre. That wasn't too good either. In fact, what we did in retribution, when we captured the soldiers, uh, the German soldiers, we would make them take their shoes and socks off and made them walk back to the POW cages uh, in the snow without any shoes. But we soon realized it wasn't too good because the medics were complaining that they had to treat them for frostbite, and that wasn't too, too good. And talk about frostbite. We had more casualties, I think, with frostbite uh, than uh, with wounded and killed, although an awful lot of them were killed. In fact, uh, I'm part of the group that meets in Fort Monmouth and also with the Coast Guard in Philadelphia, uh, two chapters I belong to. Uh, they just put up a beautiful monument uh, in memory of the veterans of the Battle of Bulge in Fort Monmouth. And uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, they're going to put up a stained glass window at the Carlisle Military uh, Center. So, uh, as we say, we keep, keep them in mind. We must never forget those who didn't come back. That's one thing. I, I just feel I'm just a lucky Joe, that's all, to be able to sit here and talk with you. Because I came so close so many times that uh, I, uh, I just feel blessed. Stan, after the Battle of the Bulge, what happened to you and your unit? Well, we went, we went back to where we sto uh, stopped, just by the Roar River. Uh, that's where we were when the bulge broke out. And uh, we had a couple of practice um, runs. 
and then came time to cross the Roar River. We had a problem in our Practice area. runs? What do you mean by practice, practice runs? Practice crossing the river with, uh, with uh, pontoon bridges, boats, depending on, we didn't know what area we were going to be assigned to cross. Right. And this was in advance of uh, advance crossing of the, the Rhine River itself? The Roar. This Roar is just river. the Roar River. We had a few rivers to cross. <laughs> and the Germans held the dams. And we were always afraid they were going to open up the dams and flood the area. Well, the area we were in, we had some flooding, and we needed boats. And it was possible to, if the engineers would build us a platoon bridge, we would be able to cross that way. So some crossed in boats, some crossed on a platoon bridge. But just before the attack, they started shelling the area. And we hit the ground. I happened to hit it in a mud hole. <laughs> So I had a rifle full of mud, myself full of mud. So I was lucky I had a clean handkerchief with me. And I took apart that rifle. There's where training comes in. We did it many times in basic training and advanced training to be able to take your rifle apart, blindfold it, and put it back together again. And that's just what I did. With my handkerchief, I wiped off the parts that were full of mud, and I got my, my rifle together again so I could fire it. Because had I not cleaned it, I never would have been able to fire it. So we crossed the, the Roar, and we were then in the, the uh, Roar Valley, R-U-H-R, -R, and the river is R-O-E-R. Sounds the same. And then our next um, uh, place we had to take and cross was the Rhine River. That was very interesting because... Uh, we had always been tra a change between the Ninth Army and the First Army, back and forth. But all of a sudden, they took us out. We were to remove all insignias, all signs of our division, and they moved us up to the British. And we, f we crossed the uh, Rhine at Wessel with the British and Canadians. That, were, that was an experience, fighting with the Canadians. Four o'clock, stop for tea. We got to Wessel, and uh, lo and behold, they had brought across France uh, these landing crafts. We didn't realize that the river where we were going to cross was so wide that they decided they were going to take uh, use the landing crafts that they use at Omaha Beach. So some of us crossed in the landing crafts, some of us crossed, the, uh, crossed in big boats, but what a display. That sky, here it was in the middle of the night, but it was like daytime. There was so much artillery and explosions in the air that it was like daylight. And we were going down to the boats. And while we were going down the boats, we passed some uh, jeeps who had radios on. And lo and behold, there's Axis Sally telling us to welcome us to the river the 30th Infantry Division, and telling us we're going to be wiped out when we cross. And uh, here we had done so much to keep the information from them that we were moving up there, and she knew it. <laughs> Axis Sally, I don't know where she got her information, but she sure knew a lot about us. Well, we crossed the river, and uh, we were on our way. And the next, of course, was to get to the Elbe River and cross it. And beyond that was Berlin. We finally, as we got to the, toward the Elbe River, maybe 10 miles, 20 miles away, we were put on the 2nd Armored Division's tanks. We were riding their tanks. We were given maps of Berlin, sections of Berlin, and that was our objective. We would cross the Elbe with, on the second armored tanks and attack Berlin. We were very unhappy participants, let me tell you. Well, why were... But unhappy, for what reason? We were happy because we got the word before we got to the Elbe River that politicians had decided they were going to let the Russians take Berlin. We were a very happy group. <laughs> the Russians came to the river south of us, uh, and then they started coming toward us. And we were in the northern end of town in an outpost. 
and we see these horse-drawn wagons, and we're looking through field glasses, and we see their Mongolian troops. Well, this, I don't like to talk to them because it was terrible. They came into town, and they pulled the women and children out, and they burned some of the houses, and they raped. We watched them, the raping the women in the street. It's, you know, this is one of the few or the many atrocities that I've witnessed, unfortunately. And we weren't too happy. We were going to have a parade with them. They were coming to Magdeburg. And uh, we had a formal meeting. Uh, but we could never trust them. Uh, part of us, before we had the formalities of, uh, in Magdeburg, crossed the river and met with the Russians, and they checked everyone that came in. They made sure if, if 55 soldiers came across, they had 55 soldiers go back. Or, and they were, it just couldn't trust them. It just felt so uncomfortable. And I was, we were very happy when we parted company. Saying there were Mongolian troops within Mongolian the Russian troops. army. In horse-drawn wagons, we couldn't believe it. This modern army, uh, well, it really wasn't that modern, but they had plenty of tanks and artillery. They would line up their artillery, one after the other, and when they let go, boy, they let go a barrage of the Russians. We freed this camp, all Polish women. They were so dirty, so filthy, their clothes were awful. They had to be fumigated. There were always a few women who were taken aside to take care of the German officers. They, you can tell by their dress, you can tell they were clean, you can tell they were well fed, but the others, it was deplorable. And uh, of course, I eventually got to the ovens and saw the ovens and I couldn't believe well, I said, man's inhumanity to man before, and that's all that it was. I just... You've seen the worst of war. What message would you have for today's generation? Well, what I tell them, I talk about the war in the high school, and what I tell them is, learn it. Life is not fear. Fair. F-A-I-R. And you will, you should, every day, commit an act of kindness. Because whatever you do, it's up to you. You're an individual. You have certain opportunities. You have roads to go down. Think about it. Any act that you do, think about it. And then make your decision. You will probably uh, make the right decision if you give yourself time to think about it and analyze the situation. Do you think your generation has a legacy? And if it does, what is that legacy? Never get despondent, never give up. There's always a, a rainbow at the end of the road. And that's the way I live my life.